Welcome to EchoCast and welcome Dr. Morris Thomas, Assistant Provost and Director at the Center for Excellence in Teaching, Learning and Assessment at Howard University. Dr. Thomas's dedication to and range of experience in the field of education dates over 20 years ago, starting at the Ohio State University as a graduate student and weaving through traditional and non-traditional education roles at Sylvan Learning, Hudson Community College, uh, the University of the District of Columbia, and now most recently uh, at Howard University, where among several roles, uh, Dr. Thomas is the Assistant Provost for Digital and Online Learning, ergo EchoCast here and ergo Echo360. In fact, Dr. Thomas has been a great advocate for learning engagement and the use of technology uh, to do so. And, uh, and he was a recently featured, uh, a recently featured speaker at Echo360's Echo Experience 22 Global Virtual Conference earlier this summer, uh, at which he shared uh, his own Enhance Learning Model. Enhance is an acronym that we'll get into in a little bit here, uh, and how Echo 360 fits into it to create a space where, in his words, a learning framework and technology meet. So let's hear more from the man himself, Dr. Morris Thomas. Welcome to EchoCast. Thank you so much. Well, it's great to it's great to have you great to have you here. And for those that didn't uh, get a chance to catch your presentation at Echo Experience Twenty Two, let's just let's if it's okay, let's just kind of jump right to the punchline and uh, let's let's start with Enhance. Uh, if you could maybe give us a little summary, uh, you don't have to do the whole uh, presentation again. Just maybe a little bit of that the summary of what it stands for uh, and sure. what was kind of the inspiration of it. Sure. Um, thanks so much, Jeff. Um, and I'm fine. I want to just say more for this interview. That's fine. <laughs> um, so it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so as far as the enhanced learning model, it is a framework that informs intentional course design and delivery. And it's uh, an acronym, as you mentioned, the enhanced, uh, the term enhanced represents seven strategies, instructional strategies. Uh, They are uh, E for engage, the N for, the first N is for navigate, um, H is for highlight, A is for assess, the second N is for network, the uh, second C is for um, connect, and then the last E is for edutain. And so um, these are seven strategies that draw from a number of different learning um, theories and um, models. And so in the instructional design landscape and teaching and learning, there are so many different theories. You have theories such as some of our big, what they call the big four. So connectivism, cognitivism, constructivism, and behaviorism. And so I'm a teaching and learning scientist. That's my little area of of expertise. But when you have other subject matter experts across the disciplines, they may not have studied these other um, teaching and learning frameworks. Then you also have such teaching and learning frameworks that deals with um, such things as university design for learning. You have other things that deal with matters of um, student development theories and um, theories about separate and connected knowing. So all of these different models and theories are represented in a more easy to use, more accessible fashion where there is language that if I don't have a teaching and learning background, I'm a subject matter expert in whatever the discipline may be, I can look at some of these more accessible terms and and glean from all of these different theories and in a more easy to access manner and employ them immediately to enhance the learning. And my learning environment. How did it? Yeah, I love it, and I want to. I'm going to dive into that last E, by the way, in just a second here. But how, where um, it's such a robust framework, how like how long was this cooking for you? You know, as you say, you're kind of in this field, but was this you know is this something that had sort of gestated over the period of a course of years, or or how did how did it actually kind of get born? So uh, I would say you mentioned my my start. Um, I was. Um, as a graduate student. So as a graduate student, I started looking at, at, at different learning. So looking at more student development theories because I was in a, an educational policy and leadership master's program that focused on student affairs. So there was the student development theory. So you had theorists such as 
um, chickering and the seven different vectors of how students develop and, and those things to go into like William Perry was thinking about the multiplicity, multiplicity of how students uh, learn and look at different ways of, of navigating through, whether it be um, more things of dualism. So looking at all these, again, looking at these theories and models as a student and as a researcher, um, I realized when I got into more of the five year development lens that a lot of these models, a lot of this language, a lot of this what can be considered kind of specific jargon was was very nuanced and not as clear for people who did not have hmm. the, those theoretical backgrounds or instructional design. And so then you get into instructional design and you start looking at things like andragogy or the, the science of Arnold Hilton and Dawson Learn. You can't necessarily expect someone who is not from these disciplines, and I'm, I'm purposely not naming other disciplines because I want to give it as general, but not from these disciplines who haven't had this background and these theories and this practice to understand this, but yet they have to teach. So it was cooking, so to speak, for a while. Um, and I would say it's still cooking because changing and transforming the learning environment is a continuum because our students continue to to to, to vary, social issues continue to, to vary that impact both the desire and delivery of the learning experience that you want to have something um, that again, I feel like it's more attainable, more accessible, more applicable mm -hmm. uh, with language that is more um, easily transferable to a broader group of educators. And so that's how the enhanced learning model um, came about. So it's been, it's been cooking for a long time, but it continues to, to cook in the mindset of continuous improvement. Yeah. I don't believe that if you are shaping or facilitating learning and enhancing learning. That's why it's called the enhanced learning model, not the enhanced teaching model or the enhanced instructor model. It's about enhancing the learning. So it's all about and focus on the learner's experience and the learner's environment. It's not, a, it's not necessarily um, just for instructors to think about what they're doing, but it's think about the overall experience for everyone. Walking right into my next question, because what, as I mentioned, I love that last E of enhance uh, around edutainment. And when you talk about making this very accessible for both faculty uh, and, and for learners, I have to imagine that, 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 that notion, and we've had, you know, friends of, of Echo 360, like Joe Pine, talk a lot about experience, the experience economy and how people are really, you know, um, not only valuing, but really expecting to be sort of animated by more than just traditional, whether it's teaching models, or if you look at commerce, you know, kind of the traditional value kind of exchange for, you know, services and goods. So how, how have you found that last E, edutainment or edutain, uh, how has that been received? Because I, I could imagine with some faculty, maybe it was a little bit of a, like a, hey, wait a minute, like I'm not, I'm not a performer here, you know what I mean? I'm an academic and, and, but I would imagine for learners, that's been a really great way to get them engaged with the material. So typically when I present this to colleagues, those other faculty members and those who are in the, um, facil facilitation of learning sphere, um, whether it be professors, instructors, TAs. I first try to get people to think about their experiences as a learner, because again, we're thinking about focusing on a learner. And typically most of us, when we think about our most impactful learning experiences, whether it be in more of an academic or non-academic environment, typically it was the overall experience, not just the subject matter that helped us to take from not knowing something or to gain from some prior knowledge to transfer to the point where we actually learn material or had transferring the knowledge and was able to embody or apply the material where there was something about it in addition to the educational or the learning piece, but something that also captured our attention. So it is not to make someone, you know, I, I won't necessarily try to argue the point as to where the educators our performers are not. I think that that could be something that we look at in, in semantics. Um, I think if you're up in front of people, you have a captive audience, one could argue that there's a level of performance to that. Um, there's a preparation, there's a script, so to speak. So edutainment strategy is not to try to make someone be a performer or, or to try to make someone be an entertainer. 
but it's understanding the psychology and the psycho so and the psychosocial aspects of learning that you take things that are educational and entertaining to help enhance the learning. Could learning take place without something that is both educational and entertaining? Absolutely, but this is the enhanced learning model. So to enhance it and to keep it and make something be more memorable, something to be more easily applicable, something to be something that someone can take and utilize um, more easily and then reaccess again and, and it stays within their um, memory. So it stays within their recall, like the, these different cognitive domains and their affective domains, that that's when you have something like edutain that takes place because it only enhances the learning. Can learning take place without the, that aspect? Absolutely. But learning will be more enhanced when there is something that really does strike a core with not only the cognitive, but also the affective domain for, for the learner. When we think of technology, uh, how uh, kind of a similar maybe sort of question, can the enhanced model, is the enhanced model, is it, is it um, j amplified? By by technology, or is it or is it kind of contingent on it? So I think the enhanced learning model can um, work without technology. So it is not just a tech model, but I think oftentimes, and and if I don't answer your question, bring it back around to it. But I want to make sure I say this. I think oftentimes technology is looked at as something to do without theory without um, without any research or evidence-based practices informing it. So it's like, let's bring some technology into it because we have technology available. So it's like technology for technology's sake. Whereas the hand learning model, when it meets with, with technology, it is saying, okay, this technology has these different functions. Let's use these functions intentionally to make sure that we're meeting these particular needs of the learners or that we are impacting the learner experience. So it's leveraging the technology to enhance the learning. It's not, it's, it's not about just being entertaining. It's not just about technology for technology sake or, or, or for gamification only. It's saying that this technology has these different features, these different capabilities. These can be used to help with of uh, different aspects, for instance, of um, edutainment, so to speak, um, or assessment. So like you think about Echo 360, Echo 360 has polling features. So the polling features provide a visual, it provides interaction. Um, it provides uh, a way to immediately see how many people are actually taking in or understanding the content that's being covered and being reviewed. So this is where the technology being leveraged with the enhanced learning model, you know, the A, B, and assess, where you're getting the bigger or the greater impact. If that makes, hopefully that makes sense. You know, it makes all the sense in the world. And when you do have the technology, uh, when one has technology at their fingertips, and we've got so much technology, almost sometimes it's like an arms race of technology. We've got so much to choose from. But, you know, there's, so you have, you have great, you're rooted in, in great, you know, pedagogy and andragogy theory. You've got access to technology, uh, like at Echo360 and others. What, what, if any, what obstacles, because you're, you're kind of a unique bird. You wear a couple of different hats at, at Howard. You're, you're both an instructor, <laughs> right? But you're also admin, you know, you're also, so you got a little bit of, you got a foot in both worlds. What kind of obstacles, if any, do you run into with, the adoption of, of a model like this? Um, I think the obstacle that one might run into is if they have an all or nothing mm -hmm. mindset um, or if you have a deficit mindset. I try not to lead our teaching and learning center from a, a, a mindset of, uh, we have brilliant faculty here, brilliant students here. So I don't try to lead it from an aspect of deficit. I try to lead it more so from a mindset of um, here's another possibility. You know, look at what you're already doing, what you want to do. How can you build upon that? And so one thing about the enhanced learning model, it is not hierarchical or um, sequential. So you can pick up maybe one of the strategies that you really want to hone in on. 
Um, you can use several simultaneously. You can use one. So for instance, you mentioned entertain. Maybe you just really wanted to add that feature mm -hmm. to your class. Maybe you already feel like that. The other things are great. You want to embrace them with that has a little bit more of an entertainment edge. You can just lean on that. So that kind of takes away from someone feeling like I must master this entire model where I must then do every single or engage in every single type of technology that's out there. No, I would say, look at, you know, what do you want to strengthen? What strength do you want to build upon? What do you want to get in, engage in? And maybe for that semester, you just get into that element and then you build upon that. See if it worked well, see if it met the requirements that, you know, that you were looking for, see if there were outcomes that happened for your learners. And if not, you know, there's a saying that says, eat the meat, <laughs> the meat spit off the bones. <laughs> So if not, you know, if it doesn't work for you, don't try yeah. to stick with that. See what, see how it goes. And I, I you know, I think when you're not, when, when we're not so rigid and when we're more open, then we have the abilities to, to enhance the learning and keep that continuous yeah. improvement. No, I love that. It's very modular and yet it does all tie together if, uh, if but, but, but the, the parts are just as as impactful as, as the whole. Um, you know, one thing I mentioned in your in your intro, I love your background uh, for the uh, both the diversity uh, of experiences, but but the consistency. Uh, you know, you can just see this almost visibly see this thread of of kind of educational integrity and and um, just commitment throughout all of these different sort of. Uh, stops along the way. So now here you're at uh, Howard University, a very well-known, very uh, prominent historically black college with a rich tradition um, and, and really a legacy for, for, you know, leveling the playing field and really fighting for educational equity and, and, and which is something that we espouse here at Echo 360 as well, you know, making sure that all learners have, have uh, the opportunities, equal, you know, access and opportunities to thrive. What, how, how has the your own direction and mission uh, been amplified uh, since taking on this role at Howard? Where you know, from from an outsider's perspective, it seems like you have such a great platform now uh, to to take all of these years, these twenty plus years of of, of experience, and, and again, it's not new because you were. You were exacting it, no matter you know what stop where you were along the way. But do you feel uh, a, a a a sense of uh, opportunity, uh, maybe even responsibility now to 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 take advantage and really leverage this the sort of stage uh, that you have here, the platform that you have here, uh, to advance, continue to advance <laughs> these aspects of educational equity? Oh, that's a great question. Um, and has many, many ways I could answer it. So I would say in brief, yes, there is uh, both an opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity. Howard University is um, a great historically black university. It is, um, and it's just a great university in general as a nationally ranked, um, national institution, highly ranked in many of its programs. Um, an alumni second to none, um, regardless of, of HBCU, private, public. Um, I cannot think of institutions that have um, a much more star-studded, prominent, um, impactful, you know, uh, our, our sitting vice president of the United States is a Howard alum, um, the first black Supreme Court justice, Howard. I mean, I can go down the line of, of these of these aspects of Howard. Um, of what Howard has contributed. And so when you, um, when one as myself has the opportunity to become a part of the legacy, as you mentioned, and of this platform, it's absolutely a responsibility. It's absolutely an opportunity. Um, but what, what I find it to be as opposed to being um, caught up in all of those aspects of it, I focus on um, the more so the responsibility aspect of it. And it becomes more sobering for me to understand that when I make impact, when I make decisions, when I do the work here at Howard, it automatically has a global reach. And so I'm very sober and careful in whatever I'm doing because I understand that I could be impacting 
the next president, the next whomever. And so I want to make sure that I am offering um, work and contributing with uh, an element of excellence, with the element of being uh, forward thinking, with looking down the line, um, and with making sure that I am um, providing the best uh, for for this particular environment. Uh, but it's definitely absolute, it's absolutely a, a, an opportunity and a responsibility at the same time that I find more sobering than than um, than the opposite. <laughs> We're very grateful that you are in this role and uh, and so sobering or exciting or just very, very, uh, uh, <laughs> either way, either, either side of the coin, uh, you are in, you're the right guy for the right job. So it's great, great to have you there. And, and so I want to thank you, uh, Dr. Thomas Morris, uh, for joining us here uh, on EchoCast and just for everything you're doing and sharing the enhanced model, sharing everything. For those that did miss it, uh, you can actually go to echo360.com and check out uh, Dr. Thomas's uh, presentation uh, on on Echo360.com there, and we're gonna let um, we're gonna let Morris go now. But everybody else, uh, stick around uh, for just a quick demonstration of some of the applications referenced here in this uh, EchoCast. And uh, like I said, you can always go to Echo360.com to check out more of these episodes and to check out more resources to create your own inspired learning experiences. Here's a quick demonstration of an Echo360 solution related to this episode of EchoCast. Reach out to us at echo360.com to learn more. The transcript editor can be accessed either from the media tiles menu in the content library or from the media details page. Depending on your course settings, you may also be able to access this from the class list page by clicking on the video icon. When the transcript editor opens, it provides a playback panel on the left, and the text of the transcript is broken out into timed cues on the right. The currently applied transcript is shown by default. In most cases, this will be the original automated transcript generated through the Amazon ASR service. In some cases, it may be the edited version or a later uploaded version. To edit the text of cues, or to change the speaker tags for any of the cues, click on Edit the Transcript. This will take you into edit mode. Once in edit mode, the right panel changes and allows you to click into any of the text cues to activate it. Once activated, you can move your cursor around within the cues or make changes to selected portions of the text or type in. Below the video, you'll notice a toggle that's pause while typing. This is a helpful tool to keep the video in sync of where you are when editing your cues so the video doesn't get ahead of you. Once you're happy with your edits, Go ahead and click outside of the cues to go to a different one. Keep in mind that you can use the find and replace to find certain words in bulk and apply edits to them in bulk. If necessary, you can use the undo and redo buttons to restore your edits. Once you're happy with all of your edits, you can save your changes by clicking save as new version. This version will be applied to the media that is shown in the transcript panel inside the classroom. Now that you have your transcript where you would like it, Please note that you are able to apply this transcription to a closed caption track. This would be activated when a user clicks the CC button inside the player. Another user is also editing the transcript at the same time and has already saved their work. You may be asked to compare differing cues where differing cues are found. You will have the chance to approve or reject your changes for each differing cue. Then save the version as the next version. Don't panic, the other user's changes, even if you reject them, are still there, but will be in the version previous to yours. Thanks for tuning in to EchoCast. For more information on these and other inspired learning solutions, visit us at echo360.com.